Hey folks, Jeremy Plunk here from First Bet and Express Bet. He's Jeff Siegel. We're here on the It's Official podcast where each week we take on five hot topics in racing. And it's Derby and Oak season officially. We're smack dab in the middle of it. Last week we had Kentucky with Turfway Park having big races on the Oaks and Derby Trail. Fairgrounds, of course, the big races, uh, Louisiana Derby and Fairgrounds Oaks. And now this week, Jeff, it just kicks up another notch as it's Florida Derby, UAE Derby, races all over the Arkansas Derby this week. This is fun time of the year. It is, and I think we're going to learn a lot uh, finally. We've been kind of waiting to mm-hmm. have these horses show up uh, in, in their final preps where it's the most important kind of tread water in the last several weeks, really. Uh, yeah. We throw, and speaking of water, we've had several of these races <laughs> on off tracks. Um, hopefully the weather will cooperate. We'll get a reasonable line on, on some of these colts that are making their last start prior to the Derby. And there's still lots to prove, really. I mean, there hasn't been one that has completely stood out and become the obvious favorite. Sierra Leone yeah. right now looks like he'd be the right one, but uh, things can change quickly. And sure. uh, we'll find out a lot this weekend, not only here, in uh, North America, but overseas in Dubai as well. The scene about to shift north. This is the last week of the championship meet at uh, Gulfstream Park. Again, last week was Arkansas Derby, or this week's Arkansas Derby Day. Last week was Louisiana Derby Day. So those fairgrounds, Oaklawn horses are about ready to come north for Keeneland and Kentucky. Can't wait for that meet. We'll be working for Keeneland again uh, this season and getting excited for all of that. Let's go to our first of five topics on the big board this week on the It's Official podcast. Last to first in Louisiana. We haven't seen a lot of tremendous this speed on this year's Triple Crown Trail, but we've seen some finishers. We got another one in the Louisiana Derby. His name, Catching Freedom. And the trailer remains Catching Freedom. Half mile at 48.33 seconds. Three quarters for Track Phantom. Woman at 12.54 seconds. It's Track Phantom who leads coming toward the quarter pole. But Common Defense has been right there with the front runner. It's Track Phantom and Common Defense. They're a neck apart as they turn for home. Antiquarian is sweeping outside of Tuscan Gold. Then toward the inside, Awesome Ruta. Hall of Fame down there with the rail. Catching Freedom is unwinding on the extreme outside to the final quarter of a mile. And it's Common Defense toward the inside. Track Phantom determined. Track Phantom sticking that neck out. Just holds Common Defense. Moving up Tuscan Gold. And here comes Catching Freedom, who's charging for Flavian Pratt. They come past the 16th. Blast to first. It's Catching Freedom to win the Louisiana Derby. Anna Marie was second to Catching Freedom. Tuscan Gold third. Track Phantom finished fourth. Last to first, indeed. And they kind of had their own match race out in the middle of the track from the top of the stretch home. Honor Marie just to the inside of Catching Freedom. They brushed each other a little bit at the top of the stretch. Good education in that respect. Those horses gave away some ground, but it wasn't just clear sailing out there. And that's what you've got to overcome if you're going to be a comfort behind horse in the Kentucky Derby. Of course, the top two in this race both came from well off the pace. And they've got that kind of running style. So if they get all the way to Louisville, as we expect them to now, they're going to have to work out a trip this is a pretty good education for the two of those honor marie and the winner catching freedom your takeaway well the 97 buyer number is good it's not great but it's good it's solid yeah. and i'm not going to criticize that catching freedom did have to uh come around uh, the field and and win but the problem with is that honor marie was 10th down the back stretch and mm-hmm. catching freedom was 11th so right. they both close and sometimes that means maybe the, the race shape or the track was playing favorable to their style. If it was only one that circled the pack, that would have been better. You know, mm-hmm. I'm really hard pressed to really know how good this race was. I can tell you one takeaway though, that I really had about this race and that I was absolutely thoroughly disgusted with track Phantom's race. I mean, uh. you know, he made the, I mean, I picked him to win. Not that that makes anything, you know, I just <laughs> one way or another, but he made the lead from the outside. He just kind of eased over. He didn't mm-hmm. have, have to be sent. He never got hooked the first part. He just kind of inherited the all-time great front-running easy trip. And mm-hmm. when he and he uh, he tried to to fight back at the eighth mm-hmm. pole, but there was nothing there. I think he mm-hmm. just maybe ran into a race a, a distance that he's just not capable of handling. Mm-hmm. So after the race was over, Steve Asmus from Trainer of um, Track Phantom was lamenting the fact that he had drawn the outside and said, maybe next time we'll draw a better post. But Steve, right. you could not. <laughs> you, had, you had forever to get over from that outside draw and made the lead, never had to be used an ounce. And uh, I think it, it either the distance got to him or maybe 
he's done too much in too short a time. Um, you know. it, it, it's it's funny because Steve Asmus is the guy who told me this quote, and it's been said by many trainers, I'm sure, over the years, but it's not how fast you go, it's how you go fast. And right. his horse had the easy trip in here, right? So, yes, he went about a second faster the opening quarter, about two seconds faster through six furlongs than he had to go last time in the Risen Star Stakes when it was really pedestrian. But this was still very pedestrian by any standard when we get to the Kentucky Derby. I mean, there's going to be some legit speed there, we would think, uh, when we get to Louisville. So you got to be able to take more heat than that. And again, yeah, track phantom kind of threw up the flag there and just hung through the stretch. He didn't just back out of it, you know, and, and, and throw the anchor out, but he kind of, you know, he, he was done. And, and, uh, you know, several horses ended up catching him, uh, as he ended up in fourth in there. catching freedom reminds me a lot. The winner here of angel vampire, Brad Cox, same running style, had a good prep campaign, he got to Churchill. He ran third, a good third in the Kentucky Derby. He ran fourth in the Belmont Stakes. He looks like a good horse, but not a great horse. And that's kind of what reminds me of Angel of Empire uh, last year. So he's in that same kind of category. When you look at a Kentucky Derby a situation or a Triple Crown race situation, he's going to be one of those top five options for you probably. But he's going to be hard-pressed to get up to that one or two option that you're really interested in gambling on on top, I would think. I would think so. I mean, he's, you know, you take him to Kentucky, at least you know he'll be finishing. And mm-hmm. if there's a race meltdown, you got a, a better chance maybe than you would otherwise. Uh, I don't think he'll embarrass himself. I think he's, no. as you pointed out, he's the kind of horse that gets a piece of it. Uh, but mm-hmm. there has to be something out there <laughs> better than him, I would think. Maybe not. Right. We'll find out. But, uh, you know, but he ran well. Honor Marie ran well. I mean, it, it was, you know, the, the, you know, there's one horse in this race that actually did catch my eye, and that was Antiquarian because he broke mm. through the gate prior to the start, right. which usually, you know, eliminates you. Yeah. And he finished fourth, and he only got beat like, I don't know, uh, two and a half lengths maybe, mm-hmm. so three lengths, whatever it was. Without that issue at the start, in just his mm. third career start, I mean, I thought he could. He had the right to completely fall out yep. of it and, and finish far back. So there's something there, I think, um, with with that aquarium that I think uh, is something to work with. I, I think the best thing for him to do would do is to shoot for some of the lesser races, maybe a race like I, you know, just not the the the, the cream type of races, but mm-hmm. some of the secondary. Peter races. Pan, something like Peter that, Pan might be great. Yeah. And then yeah. let him build himself up again. He's only had the. Uh, the three starts. So let him uh, let him advance at his proper rate, and then maybe by the summer you're right there with these guys. So anyway, I, that's the other horse of the race that I'm taking out of. Um, but I, I respect catching freedom. I just pretty sure he's not going to be my top pick. Right. Let's move to Turfway Park on Saturday where things went as expected. It was endlessly a solid favorite in the race coming off the turf and the synthetics in Southern California and Northern California coming to Kentucky for the Jeff Ruby delivered as expected, but maybe not the post-race interview that we all expected. He's the gray is launching his charge. He's four wide at the quarter pole, getting within two and here comes endlessly. Endlessly is really closing in strongly. He's all dressed up in Sunday's best. He swings one from the outside. A ton of momentum at the top of the lane for Endlessly. And here he comes with his run. Endlessly makes his move at the eighth pole. And he has come away with the lead. Endlessly storming home. And look at him. Endlessly is free and focused in the Jeff Ruby. And he's a powerful winner. West Saratoga, I think, hangs on for second. A big place photo there. There were five horses involved. And when you talk about Kentucky Derby qualifying points, somebody got 50, the others got 25 or less. And that 30 point threshold is generally where we see the Kentucky Derby qualifying cutoff. So a couple big necks and noses there on the wire at Turfway uh, for the also rans. But it was all about the winner here. Endlessly was much the best in there. Great call from Tony Kahlo, I thought, uh, covering his first. Uh, Jeff Ruby did a great job with the call. This is the way you visually want to look coming down the lane. Now, some horses, you know, just thrive on the synthetic and look like this and, and are really getting into it. 
Michael McCarthy, after the race, said Crown Royal American Turf at Churchill's probably next, not the Kentucky Derby. So when we talked about the post-race interview that we didn't expect, not that you think that McCarthy's absolute to throw this horse onto the dirt at some point, but Derby fever is a real thing, and you just kind of feel like when you've got a chance to run in it that you will. He didn't opt that direction for now, Jeff, but I guess, I don't know, the door's always open, right? They're not going to draw entries for the Derby, I believe. I think they're drawing the Saturday or Sunday before this year, so uh, they've got some time to make that decision. I don't understand it myself. I I, I understand that he wants to do right by his horse, but mm-hmm. if ever a horse deserves the chance to run for the mm-hmm. roses, it is, is it not endlessly? I mean, here's a quote that, will obviously run all day. The mile and a quarter will be no problem for him. He's one of these horses that doesn't have a great burst of acceleration. But he, what he does have is he has a long run in it. Right. He, you can let him. He's not going to hang on you. He's going to keep going. Mm-hmm. You know. Now, I know he's by Oscar Performance, who was a grass horse. But he's got some dirt horses so far. Yeah. Out of him, our Langfuhr, he was a dirt horse. So mm-hmm. now you could say... All right, well, he's trained out here at Santa Anita. He's trained on the dirt. Michael knows his own horse. Maybe mm-hmm. he hasn't trained all that well on the dirt already, but Santa Anita's dirt track is very deep and sluggish and, and and testing. And just because you don't train that well on this dirt doesn't mean you wouldn't train mm-hmm. very well and run very well at Churchill Down. So what I hope happens here is that he takes him to Churchill, breezes him on the dirt, and if he, mm-hmm. he can handle him, give him a chance. I mean, it's not like... Right. I mean, Seattle slew and affirmed or not in this race, the last I checked. Right. So he's a, a long striding, very athletic colt, kind of a push mm-hmm. button colt, very professional. He's one on grass, he's one on all weather. What the heck couldn't he run on dirt? You yeah. Know? So I hope well, he gets that chance. I really do. That the chance of that happening really does like geographically improved by what they've done because they're already in Kentucky. Now they're yeah. saying they're going to run in the crown Royal American turf at Churchill downs. You could just head to Louisville. He might already be there for all I know. He might already be at Churchill downs and bed it down. And you could spend a month there getting acclimated and situated sure. and, and see how he likes the track again, give him many opportunities to, to work over the track. I mean, the late great John Asher, the publicist for Churchill downs once told me as a cub handicapper back in the early days, if there's ever a dirt track in America where a turf horse is going to take to it, it's Churchill Downs. And that's one that, you know, we've seen some success. I mean, you talk Animal Kingdom and more recently, I mean, the last two Kentucky Derbies, it was uh, Rich Strike winning this race coming off the turfway races in the winter. And then last year it was two fills running second in the Kentucky Derby coming off of this same kind of race where two fills and this horse in the, uh, stretch run and draw off looks similarly powerful. You know, I'm not saying he's as good as two fills. We would find out, uh, you know, if, if he gets a chance to run in the Kentucky Derby, but the success of the horses coming off this race to the Kentucky Derby over the past two years, it's got to factor into your uh, thought process just a little bit. The other thing too, is they have an all expenses fees paid trip to the Preakness stakes already set up. If they want to go that route via his win at uh, El, in the El Camino Real Derby at Golden Gate Field. So maybe if they're thinking we are going to take a shot on the dirt somewhere, maybe not the Kentucky Derby and wait for the Preakness to do it, but I don't know. I mean, if you're going to run in the crown Royal American turf, then you're not going to come back two weeks later to go in the Preakness. You know, I mean, you only go Derby Preakness if you're going to go on a two week interval. So if they, you know, if they are really going towards the Crown Royal American Turf, then I don't think you're going to see him on third at all. You know, I don't in the Triple Crown series. So, uh, endlessly, he's a talented horse. I mean, it's not easy, Jeff. You know this. He's won at Del Mar. He's won at Santa Anita. He's won at Golden Gate. And then he was able to go on the road and win again uh, coming east. I mean, that's versatility that not a lot of horses have. All those kind of two-turn races, like you say, stamina is there. Oscar Performance, you mentioned, he's got the good dirt horse, Tumba Rumba. It can happen. You know, a good stakes winner down at Gulfstream Park uh, for Brian Lynch. So, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm with you in here. I, I would rather see him in the Kentucky Derby. I don't want anybody to ruin their horse, but I'm not so sure that running in the Kentucky Derby ruins a particular horse. I know that's an off-told, uh, you know, uh, tale on the internet and, and amongst turf riders over the years that the Derby chews up horses. Some do, some do for sure, and others, you know, thrive and, and go on to excellent careers. So some horses get blown out in the Kentucky Derby and turn out to be very good racehorses down the line in their careers. So there's no shame. And 
I don't know. There's nothing better than running in the Kentucky Derby to me uh, in horse racing. And I think if you've got a horse who's got the opportunity to do so, the talent to do so, he's he's not going to embarrass himself. I think this is a horse who belongs in the Kentucky Derby field. Who won last year's American turf, by the way? You remember? I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> who cares, right? <laughs> this is the Derby for crying out loud. And yeah. I say, I mean, it's not like he's a speed horse who's going to get chewed up. He's going to mm-hmm. sit back, lay back, make a run, and the jock can at the five sixteen ball. If he's not handling it, don't yeah. you know, take a hold. But who yeah. knows what he can do? And, and like I said, I hope Mike Michael Tate changes his mind because of all the horses that have been entered in the Derby over the years that didn't belong, this mm-hmm. one belongs. Yeah, you know. So yeah, and we'll see what happens in the next month or so, but. Hopefully uh, he'll train well enough to get that chance. That would be kind of fun. West Saratoga did win that photo in the Jeff Ruby to get the 50 qualifying points and had some others already. So he is the representative right now from that race. Who's probably safely in the field for the Kentucky Derby. We'll see if the winner joins them in a couple weeks time when they have some more time uh, to decide. Let's go to our uh, third topic on the board this week. Our triple crown tracker continues. We've got some news from Oaklawn. Gulfstream Park, and of course, made on in the UAE as we've got the UAE Derby uh, coming up this weekend. First off, we want to talk about a horse who ran last week at Oak Lawn in the Hot Springs Stakes. It's just a mile, but it was a good chance for Nash to get back on the beam. One of the more impressive horses this winter at Fairgrounds. He needed a confidence boost, and I think he got it. Nash is making a move now. Nash on the outside is let loose. He's trying to catch Frost free around the turn. Otto the Conqueror plodding along in fifth. He's had enough. The other two are well out of it. Coming to the top of the lane. Frost free still in front. Nash in the Godolphin blue on the outside, though he's roaring to the front. And Nash just blew by his competition. Kicks on, kicks away, and now it's just a guessing game of how much he's going to win by. Nash looking just like he did when he broke his maid, and that's a nice effort here wrapped up nash with a nice confidence booster brad cox has got a lot of ammo right we already saw he won the louisiana derby on saturday he's got horses to go for the wood the bluegrass the arkansas derby all the big races where might nash fit into that equation is he back in the triple crown discussion now jeff after winning that listed stakes the hot springs well i think he'd be a good candidate for a race like the lexington don't you think Mm -hmm. um yeah. Or, or if they really want to shoot, uh, uh, come back in the in the bluegrass. I think I would, if I were his connections, I would say, okay, he's not the best, but mm-hmm. we, maybe he can pick up the pieces of some of these other horses dropped by the wayside. Right. Run him in the Lexington. Maybe come back in the Preakness if we mm-hmm. wanted to. Um, uh, uh, wait for that. Or there are other really good races in the summer for a colt like this. Right. That uh, that can get better. He's by medallion to oral. They, Generally, are late developing. Uh, he never he didn't spend one ounce of energy in winning this race here. He just no. never had to take a deep breath. He just kind of cruised around there when he when the jock was going to ask him to run. He realized, wait a minute, I'm already five in front. What do I have to yeah. do? You know. So um, easy win, impressive win. I like the way he sat off the pace. Yeah. And uh, there's there may be a big race somewhere down the road for him. And if not, there's always races like the Ohio Derby and those kind of races that right. And pick up, but I think there is a chance that he might be better than that. When he dazzled in his debut, we talked about him and we talked about his damn Sarah Louise, who was a really good sprinter, you know. And so is he just a miler type? And and that might be his best lick. And what kind of races are out there? The Pat Day mile, they could aim for something like that. If they wanted, they could cut back to seven eights in the Woody Stevens. But if they want to stay that long route and maybe get to the preakness, he's not a Kentucky Derby horse at this point for sure. But like you mentioned, the Lexington and a mile on the 16th makes a lot of sense. There's also a race that's on the Oakland schedule, it's only a couple years old called the bathhouse rose stakes that set up specifically to get horses towards the preakness since oakland extended their meet beyond arkansas derby day remember they used to end on arkansas derby then they run one more race the trails end and that would be the end of the meet now they run all the way into may until derby day so there's another stakes yet coming up on the schedule for these three-year-olds that maybe nash stays for that the bathhouse row and then that race produced a horse for the preakness last year so he could find his way maybe into the preakness two different routes the bathhouse row there at oakland the 
of Lexington at Canelands, a race that Brad Cox usually has a horse or two for, uh, would make a lot of sense. And again, they could always just say, let's just make a miler out of this horse and see what they can do and aim towards the Pat Day mile on the uh, Derby weekend card. So a lot of good options. But what we do know about Nash is when he's good, he's pretty darn good. And uh, he's one to watch uh, coming out of Arkansas. Now, one to watch going to Arkansas coming up this week for Arkansas Derby. The road trip for Bob Baffert uh, continues to Oak Lawn. It's a trail that he's beaten down many times in the past. He's going to do it this Saturday with Muth. And Muth was out working oh, in the last weekend. Uh, I believe this was Friday of last week. Muth and Winstock in company here. Winstock, of course, the horse who uh, won the Los Alfie Churdy and then got blown out in his road trip to Oak Lawn. Muth is going to make that trip, and we'll take a look at the entries for the Arkansas Derby in just a bit. He'll make the trip this time for Baffert. You have to think he's taken a stronger contender to Hot Springs this time than he did last. Muth against Winstock here in the work, Jeff. Yeah, this is a colt that on his best day, he's really good, although I, I'm not convinced he wants to run much more than nine furlongs. But he's had some days in the morning where he hasn't looked all that great. But this one was good. You can see him on the outside. He's kind of pulling the, the rider there. Winstock's pretty decent sort of colt himself. And um, clearly, Muth is going the better of the two here. And I think Bob has to be really happy uh, with the way he's come around now in the last couple of weeks, he's going to put him on a plane and win a race that, quite frankly, should be within his range if he runs his best race. Uh, and then we'll find out after that, uh, probably the Freakness, because he certainly can't run in the Derby. But this is a good work for him. This is this is a good version of Muth. And uh, I, I think he's on, on the right, right side now. I, I really do. And he's going to gallop out well. And uh, I would be, based on this workout, I'm – thinking he might be the one to beat for sure uh, on, uh, in his next start in Arkansas. Let's take a look at the field for the Arkansas Derby. Ten of them have entered. Muth is the 8-5 to five morning line favorite. Timberlake, the two, coming off the win in the Rebel Stakes, the 9-5 to five morning line second choice. Third choice in there is Mystic Dan, and Mystic Dan uh, won the Southwest Stakes in the slop uh, earlier in the meet. So you've got the winners of the Southwest and the Rebel in this matchup with the out-of-towner, and it's Muth and Bob Baffert. I think he's won the Arkansas Derby eight or nine times, so this is not news for Baffert to bring one in who's got a lot of respect. You know I love liberal arts. I've been talking about this horse for a couple months now and was waiting for him. They uh, ran in the Southwest, but the Southwest ended up rescheduled this year and was too close to the Rebel to run back in both races. So they decided to skip the Rebel. Robbie Medina's got a fresh horse coming towards the Arkansas Derby. I think he's got a big shot from off the pace. Liberal Arts, definitely a closer. So, you know, we figure Muth would show some speed. The Mystic Dan, Timberlake, the other contenders in here have more forward action about them than what we'll see with Liberal Arts. They're going to have to go fast for him to come along and get a piece here. But I think he could be looking at as many as three horses out of this year's Arkansas Derby who end up uh, in Louisville in a couple weeks here. This is a pretty good field. It's not deep, Jeff. I don't think you get on four horses in here in your exact considerations. No, I think you're right about that. I I think that the um, the form here is going to hold uh, Muth at eight to five, and I like him a little bit better on his best day, uh, really over Timber Timberlake. If I'm not mistaken, they actually ran against each other in the Breeders' Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, the considerably the better of the two at that stage. It looks to right. me like Muth is back to that kind of form. Mystic Dan is the wild card. If he's no better. If he's as good as he looked last time out on the slop, he's right there. If he reverts to his main track form, you probably won't find him. So I don't know what to think <laughs> of him. Um, but your cold liberal arts, the one you like at 15 to 1, should, certainly should outrun those those odds. Um, so it's a good race. But, uh, of course, Muth, uh, he can win by 10, and there's no derby for him. And uh, that would be a, a shame if, uh, if he were to do that and we can't see him uh, – uh, uh, at Churchill, but that's the way it, we, you know, we're not, we're prepared for that. If it happens right. in the meantime, uh, it'll make the preachers that much better. Let's go to the two-year-old champion, Fierceness. He's been training in company with Tuscan Sky in some recent workouts at uh, Palm Beach Downs. This one back on the 15th. He worked again this past weekend, but the video we're watching here is the good version of Fierceness, right, Jeff? You've talked about it. When he gets things his way, he's awfully, awfully good. His maiden win at Saratoga was mind-blowing. His Breeders' Cup Juvenile winner was mind-blowing. And then the way he kind of just waved the towel was mind-blowing last time out in the Holy Bull. What version of him did we get in the floor? Florida Derby coming up this Saturday. Well, if he gets the kind of trip that I think he's going to get, you're going to get this version, and this version is very good. Uh, breezing on the inside, much the best over an ice cold who simply could not uh, keep up with him and mm -hmm. just 
kind of coasting around there. What I like about the the the, the um the post here is he's outside the other speed. Um, Hades, who's inside, is definitely going right. to go. Um, but fierceness, we know he's pretty quick himself. He, you know, he pressed the pace in the British Cup Juvenile and came away. And he can do that. He can stalk and kick on with it when he's when his mind is is right. And um, you know, every other race, you can't, you know, you can't trust him. But the way he's been breathing, all he really has to do, as far as I'm concerned, is come out of the gate cleanly secure that pace stalking trip outside into the clubhouse turn and mm -hmm. try to replicate the same kind of trip that he got in the Breeders Cup or in his maiden race. If he does that, he's just better than these, I think. Now, I like yeah. Conquest, War Conquest Warrior. I think he's going to run well. I don't know if he's got the natural God-given talent that Fierceness has, but I'm pretty right. sure he's going to step forward and run well. I expect him to at least hit the board. But if the real Fierceness shows up um, – He's going to be tough. Although Hades, he's not going to back up. He's not going to wave the white flag. You got to, you got to work to get by him. Right. And, um, and of course, those are the three we're going to talk about. But this is a good race. I mean, I mean, we're going to find out one way or the other which of these three uh, deserve, uh, you know, the strong backing that they'll probably get in in Kentucky if if they run as well as we think they will. I like the fact that the two main players in this race kind of have similar styles, right? Hades is going to be forward. Fierce is going to be forward. They're going to find each other early, and we're going to find out which one of those two survives uh, the head-to-head -head matchup. Then it's up to Conquest Warrior, who's really the other horse in this race, as good as he's run at the meet. Now he gets the class test. He'll be the one trying to finish. Maybe he splits them. Maybe he catches them both. Maybe he just simply runs out of room and ends up third in here and isn't strong enough to come beat two good front runners like this. But tactically, Tactically, you would have to think this race is just what the doctor ordered for fierceness because he needs to have things his way from the outside. Like you said, he's not going to have a lot of, you know, pressure and things like that. He can just go and get over in a mile and an eighth. They've got a good enough run into the clubhouse turn that he shouldn't be hung out there. He's got Hades to catch. Hades is undefeated in three starts to Florida Brad for Joe Orsino. Good to see Orsino back on the triple crown trail. It's been a long time for him since red bullet winning the Preakness and beating Fusaichi Pegasus back in the 2000. So uh, good to see Joe Arsino back with a quality three-year-old and uh you know this Florida Derby could have two to three horses but for three horses in this race to make it to the Kentucky Derby you're gonna have to see Conquest Warrior or somebody else get up into the second spot there's not enough points on the bottom for one of these horses to kind of get 25 in the third hole and probably get into the Kentucky Derby the way it usually works out on points this will be a little bit different points wise though in this year's Derby with the Baffert horses eligible to run in the preps and they keep their points. Yeah. We might not need as many points as we're used to seeing to get Ooh. in on the bottom of the Kentucky Derby field because Bob might be taking 100 out of Arkansas that aren't on the deck anymore, you know, or 50 sure. if his horse happens to run second, that sort of thing like that. Same way with the Santa Anita Derby. Could be a Baffert 1-2 finish where the Santa Anita Derby is giving away 25 points, you know, to its highest point earner that's eligible to the Kentucky Derby. So we'll see what the points end up with in this one. Uh, we've got two major preps here stateside coming up, though, on Saturday. Arkansas Derby, Florida Derby, can't wait for those. Florida Derby Day's got a $25,000 exactathon. Getting my pick set for that one. The card's already drawn. Can't wait for that uh, to play it with First Bet and Express Bet coming up uh, this Saturday. Uh, also this Saturday, it's Dubai World Cup Day in the Far East, in the or not in the Far East, but in the Middle East, I should say. Uh, the UAE Derby is part of that undercard. And Jeff, when we talk about international horses coming in for the Kentucky Derby. Not often do we have advance notice on these horses. Usually they're like at the last minute we hear about them, right? right? Forever Young's a horse we've known about now for a little while, and that makes him a little bit different. He's not a Rossi known here in the U.S. yet and mm -hmm. waiting for his reappearance, but we've known about Forever Young for a couple months. We love the way that uh, he was able to win in Saudi Arabia despite a trip that really didn't go all his way. Uh, in the UAE Derby, we're expecting him to do something bigger, I would hope. Let's give the fans a chance to see that race in Saudi Arabia, and then I want to get your take on the UAE Derby contender forever young. As they straighten, Bentonato, the first one to commit. Behind these, Bookham, Dano, the Americans go one, two. Now Forever Young is forced to dig in because he's given them a three-length start at the top of the home run. It is Bentonato and Bookham, Dano, Forever Young at this stage. He's flat. He's got three lengths still to find. 300 metres to do it as Bookham, Dano moves through to lead for Irad Ortiz. Now Forever Young, belatedly beginning to pick up. Bookham, Dano needs the line now as Forever Young surges on the outside. Bookham 
Bokumdano forever young is coming. Bokumdano all out. Forever young dives and may have got it in the final bound. Forever young and Bokumdano could go either way here. Bukumdano, a high-quality sprinter, Myler from the U.S. It was forever young, able to get him. Yoshida Yohagi, the trainer, the uh, most famous trainer in Japan, couple-time winner of Breeders' Cup races here stateside. He knows how to get one ready to come over here and win. I can't emphasize that enough. This isn't like new blood here trying something completely different. And Yohagi, I think, will try to get more out of his horse in the uh, big race coming up Saturday. They stretch out to a mile and three sixteenths. That's a big difference. That's where we know he excels. I, mean, I was amazed that he was able to get up going a one-term mile and beat a very good horse in Bookham Dano. I know he's a New York bred and all that, but he's a good horse. And for him to have to catch him with, you know, th three lengths, make up three lengths with like 100 yards to go, I mean, he, right. he just accelerated. And we know, we don't have to worry about him flattening out going a mile and an eighth or farther because he's already been there. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, you know, he doesn't change lanes. He's not the greatest mover in the world, but – Man, what an engine he has. Uh, Forever Young is a serious racehorse. And if he, I really kind of hope that he goes out and demolishes that field. It adds to the, to the storyline, doesn't it? And if he oh, shows, absolutely. And um, um, I, I just, I think he's a good horse. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I really do. And uh, he's relentless. And I like that in a racehorse. He's number one in John White's poll for the uh, Kentucky right. Derby. And, uh, He's got some respect here stateside. Like you said, if he dominates and runs a cracker here on Saturday, that's going to make things a lot more exciting. That's what we want to see. A Blues and Royals kind of performance, if you remember that UAE Derby yeah. from way back when, 2005, 2006, in that era, when, when he just ran away with it and everybody was buzzing about him. Now, one of the bus horses in the U.S. who we'll see in a week's time is May Moon. He was in a gate work yesterday. It was his first workout in about nine days. And May Moon from the gate, Jeff, he's working in company with Baffert Stablemate Recall and Reload. Take us through the move and tell us about May Moon, who's headed next to the Santa Anita Derby in a week's time. His workmate is not a great horse, but he is an allowance winner, and I, I understand why Bob would match him up, because obviously you want to get a good, solid work in here uh, uh, in what would be his final serious work prior to the Santa Anita Derby. He's on the outside, and um, you can see uh, May Moon just kind of coasting. I mean, not going fast at all. Uh, and uh, I don't think he wanted anything too fast, but he wanted him to at least get something out of the work. And here he kind of responds a little bit to some chirping there to open up, quickly open up a length. Mm -hmm. And the, the rider says, okay, I, I don't want to overdo it here. We don't need anything. Like that. <laughs> so I'm going to take him wide and get him away from the workmate. And I'll, I'll, I'll let him finish out. Um, you know, of course, Bob's probably on the walkie talkie telling him what to do here. Right. Uh, but, you know, I mean, he, he's not being knocked about or anything. And he's still going to turn in a good time at 112 and 2. It's all he really needs. Yeah. Um, and he gets over the ground so well um, that you'd have to think that May Moon um, is uh, going to be fitter in his next race than he's ever been. The other thing about this, he didn't, did you notice, uh, Jeremy, he didn't do anything, not, didn't do anything stupid. You know, no. he was straight as a string there, changed leads right on cue, didn't lug in, didn't drift in. He's learning. That's kind of right. a scary thought when you think about what he's capable of doing. We know the natural talents there, but yeah. mentally he's learning. And uh, that's a kind of, a, that's, that's a good thing to see. I, I don't think there's any doubt that he'll win the San Diego Derby. He's got nothing mm -hmm. to do with his stable mates and you know, he's better than they are. Right. Uh, but then after that, it's on to the Preakness and then we'll, we'll see how he matches up with, with the Derby winner and whoever else is in there. Who do you like better? May Moon or Muth? Oh, I like May Moon. Yeah, I, I trust him more, you know. And mm -hmm. the other thing about May Moon is that I think he'll run farther. I'm still not convinced um, right. Muth wants to run. He can go a mile and an eighth if he's running against horses he's better mm -hmm. than. I think that's his limit. But the way this colt travels is the effortless action that he puts together. Uh, May Moon, to me, would would absolutely run a mile and a quarter uh, if, he asked, if he's asked to do that. And I think he will be asked to do that. Maybe not now, but how about in the fall? <laughs> Or the Belmont Stakes. Uh, yes, you know, it was a mile and a quarter too. this year. And Maybe. like I said, final quarter at Saratoga, I think you're going to see a lot bigger Baffert influence in the Belmont than ever before. 
uh, because of the race configuration, the distance, all that goes with it. It's not big Sandy. It's not 12 furlongs. And for Baffert, it's not at the end of three races in five weeks. Uh, right. I think he's going to have, he may point one horse to the Preakness and one of the others. If he's got May Moon and Booth, he may not run them both in the Preakness. He might point one to the Belmont, point one to the Preakness and try to attack both that way. We'll see, but we'll know in more in two weeks time, uh, about 10 days time, because we've got this week's race coming up uh, with uh, uh, Booth in the Arkansas Derby and then May Moon who we just saw work will run in the Santanita Derby uh, in a week's time. One other workout to let you know about over the weekend. We did see Sierra Leone on the workout tab Sunday at Payson Park. He's been working every Saturday like clockwork, but it was really wet Saturday morning, as you saw, uh, playing the Gulfstream races that were all washed onto the Tapita on Saturday. So they worked him on Sunday. So if you're looking for that work every Saturday from Sierra Leone, he didn't miss a work. He was on the tab Sunday uh, at Payson Park. You can check all that action out at xbtv.com we've got all the great workouts for you uh there okay now on our triple crown tracker over the past month or two we've been looking at our top 20 countdown rankings from countdown to the crown.com uh, my website and uh, weekly scouting report for the three-year-olds here's the way i've got them ranked coming up this friday this takes into account what we just saw over the past weekend the horses in gold jeff are horses who are done prepping at this point not only are they done prepping but they have enough points probably to get themselves into the kentucky derby field tuscan gold the only one in question there. He's got 25 points right now, but I think if he doesn't get in the Derby, we've seen Chad Brown go fresh into Preakness in recent years with a lot of success. So I think 13 on my rankings, Tuscan Gold, could make his next start in the Derby or the Preakness. Next start for each horse listed uh, in the parentheses there. Sierra Leone, the uh, just mentioned worker on Sunday for Brown. He'll run next in the Bluegrass Stakes. He holds my number one ranking. If Fierceness comes back and runs his Breeders' Cup Juvenile again in the Florida Derby, we'll have a discussion in a week's time how we're going to rank him but for right now uh, i'm going to slot him in there second forever young if he runs a banger in uh, the uae maybe he moves up as well uh, what do you make of the list and where we're at? I know deterministic horse for the Wood Memorial now. We talked about maybe training up the Gotham winner to the Kentucky Derby, but Christoph Clement has mentioned now that the Wood Memorial reportedly would be his next stop. And he certainly is one I think you think can move up these rankings and in a lot of people's opinions. I do. I I, I mean, he, from where what he's done so far, that's probably an accurate ranking. But I do think among the others that, are, that he's around uh, surrounded by, I think he's got more potential, more upside right. to advance. So, uh, but he still has to go out and do it. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I mean, fierceness. Here's the thing, Jeremy. I can easily see fierceness in the Florida Derby break running, sit second, dispose of Hades, open up, draw up, win by five or six. I can see that happen because he yes. did already in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Mm -hmm. But is that going to make me trust him in a twenty horse field when yeah. he breaks the, like the three hole or something with speed around? I don't know. You know, I'm not yeah. sure learn all that much about fierceness other than what he can do on his best day when everything goes his way so that's right. my fear <laughs> but i will i hope he does it at least again it'll it'll give him a chance to uh you know be in the conversation um uh, and the same thing with forever young you got him third uh, which is higher than a lot of people i would put him third at least uh if he goes out and performs up to his capabilities which i expect he'll do uh in uh in maidan then um there, there are three solid right there and May Moon, unfortunately, we won't have to be able to test him against this group until the Preakness. Um, but after that, I think we're looking at, I think there's a drop off after that. I, I yeah. think those, those are the four that uh, that I'm highest on. And we'll see if anybody can step forward in, in their final prep and, and join that, that, that top list. And fierceness is not solid in that spot, right? We've seen that he can run really good or really bad. So he's one bad effort away from not even being a derby horse, but he's a good effort away from being the derby favorite. It's really the kind of ice that you're uh, skating on uh, when you look at fierceness with one prep to go. Now, these are the horses that we've got in the field, in the clubhouse, if you want to put it in golf terms. They've already played their 18, Jeff. They're ready to go to Louisville. Uh, they're finished prepping at this point, and they probably have the points to play. T.O. Password is a horse from Japan that won the Japan Road to the uh, Kentucky Derby qualifier over the weekend. It's reported on Twitter today from Churchill Downs that they have accepted the invitation to come. So 
T.O. Password is in the field for the Kentucky Derby. He doesn't have to worry about the top 20. Uh, it would be reduced down to 19 if he accepts his invitation uh, from Japan, and they have. So I've got him on the list. Catching Freedom's got 125 points. He's obviously in the field. Circled him because he's the one in the photo there of his win in the Louisiana Derby. Track Phantom, Wild Saratoga, Honor Marie, three horses that ran this past weekend. Uh, they have enough points to play in the Kentucky Derby if their connections go on. No more time has been training up to this since the Tampa Bay Derby. Second place finish. A common defense for Kenny McPeak's got enough points. Kind of ran a decent race uh, over the weekend, but not a great race when he was fifth. Uh, not beaten very far, though, in that uh, blanket finish of the Louisiana Derby in behind the winner. And then you've got a couple horses that might need a little bit of help in terms of points. Sees the gray, lost the photo at Turfway, sitting there with D. Wayne Lucas at 27 points. Maybe they run back into Lexington to try to get a few points and make it into the Kentucky Derby field if they would need to in a couple weeks' time. And Tuscan Gold, a horse who I thought ran pretty well in the Louisiana Derby. I've been high on him for a while. For as inexperienced as he was and as wide as he was, the third in the Louisiana Derby was pretty a uh, pretty good effort for him. He's now got 25 points, and he'd be on the brink. Again, if he doesn't get in the Derby, I see Chad Brown moving that one on up to the Preakness Stakes. But if you look at this list, Jeff, that's seven names that have 37 points or an automatic qualifier already in the 20 horse field for the Kentucky Derby. So we're one third of the way full because you're not going to get above 37 uh, to at that threshold cutoff. If these horses were to stay healthy and they want to, and their connections want to run in the Kentucky Derby, you're already looking and we didn't put endlessly on this list. He would obviously be in there off the win at Turfway, but they're telling us right now he's not going, but at least seven names of the 20 already kind of etched in if they want to go. I think by the time the uh, Derby uh, is uh, the entries are drawn, you and I will have talked enough about endlessly that he'll be in the field. We'll talk him into the day. <laughs> I don't want to move there. He deserves to be in there, but you're right. Uh, as at this stage, you got to take the trainer for his word. But hey, uh, he can change his mind, and we can help change it. <laughs> so anyway, we'll go for it. But that's a good group right there. And um, again, now uh, you'll see some changes, I'm sure, uh, after this weekend. Well, with all the preps last week and all the preps this week to look at, that was the longest Triple Crown tracker segment we've had on its official for sure. So let's move and take a little time for the Oaks Phillies here on our fourth topic this week. The Oaks division hasn't been stellar this year, but it's starting to take shape. Down at the fairgrounds and the fairgrounds Oaks, there were a rematch in there of the Rachel Alexander that we thought could be definitive, and it turned out to be so. But Tarifa was the one who pulled up her end of the bargain. Our pretty woman from a looming up Tarifa. Vivi's dream together with Intricate as they come toward the quarter pole. Then we trail back to Midsummer March and finally accommodate Eva. Three quarters, one minute, 12.42 seconds. They turn for home and there goes Tarifa. For Flavian Pratt, Tarifa has taken the lead from our pretty woman who tries to respond to Tarifa into this final fairground spurlong. And these two fillies face off. It is Tarifa narrowly. Tarifa from toward the inside of very game. Our pretty woman. Vivi's dream is third. It is Tarifa narrowly over our pretty woman tarifa triumphant and the fairgrounds oaks beats our pretty woman by three quarters of a length so it's tarifa she you know she delivered she came back off that rachel alexander win over intricate and maybe even got better in here she's really asserting herself as the cream of a not so stellar crop of three-year-old fillies this year intricate just doesn't look like she's as good as she was as a two-year-old or as promising as she was as a two-year-old and hasn't moved forward vv's dream just kind of is solid and, and ran a solid third in here but uh, the top two really have kind of made their name for the Oaks, I think, in here. Yeah, that, that's what I would think, Tara, Tarifa. And of course, she doesn't have to worry about Kinza, who's not going. But right. I think if you matched up Tarifa with Kinza, you'd have one heck of a Kentucky Oaks, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Kinza's the Bob Baffert trainee, obviously. Baffert banned from the Derby, also from all the Churchill Downs races. So, right. so Kinza is the best of the West, but she will not be eligible for the Oaks. Yeah, and it's too bad because she's right there with Tarifa. Or Tarifa's mm -hmm. right there with Kinza, who's undefeated. Um, our pretty woman ran really well. Um, she's solid, but intricate is going backwards. Um, and he hit this a lot. These two year old Phillies don't always train on and be good three year old. That's just the way it is. In fact, uh, there's more, more so of that happening than it is with the Colts when you see the two turning threes, even though you wouldn't think there would be any difference. But I, I see a lot of situations where two year old Phillies just don't develop, you know, and I think that's yep. the case with intricate. But Tarifa certainly has, and why shouldn't she? Being by Bernardini and out of America by Awesome again, uh, Kite Beach. So 
Um, she's got a big future and uh, probably the one to beat uh, on the first Friday of May. The big race still to come in the Oaks division is the Ashland at Keeneland. We've also got one coming up uh, in New York as well, where Jody's pride in the Combly probably could make her name for uh, the Oaks that direction. Of course, the Keeneland race. And then this Saturday, actually, we also have another big race, the Fantasy at Oaklawn, where Lemon Muffin for Dwayne Lucas is among that. One of the names we haven't seen in the entry box at all this year, just FYI, the two-year-old champion from last year. She was supposed to run earlier this year at Gulfstream, had to take out of that race race she's only had one work since february 24th uh that wasn't this saturday or this week it was two weeks ago so she even missed the work last week jeff time's running out for her this is a list of i believe 12 names here that are the top 12 in the point standings right now towards the kentucky oaks that's why we have them and they're listed in their points order at this point but this year's oaks looking like tarifa and a lot of others our pretty woman only had what two starts prior to that race at fairgrounds so maybe she improves um and she could be you know that other half half when you're looking at a matchup uh here in the kentucky oaks but right now tarifa looks like an odds on favorite yeah i mean she's got that great style where she stalks the pace presses the pace and then if she just keeps going i mean she doesn't have any great massive burst but um she looks like she's got mile and eighth written all over her and pedigree wise uh she should continue to get better with maturity, with age, with development, and looks like the number one Philly back east at this stage that you can count on. She's in form. She's healthy. you got to be healthy and in form. And uh, I think we can count on her to be in Kentucky and, and show her stuff. Let's finish up with our fifth and final topic as we do each and every week, our Stars of Tomorrow segment. We're taking a little bit of a twist this week because – this Philly's already a star in Louisiana. Now we're going to find out maybe on the national stage if he's one you're going to learn about down the road because super freak uh, overcharge. She did it again over this past weekend, winning the Paige Cortez Stakes. This is a turf sprint, folks. We pick it up with nobody else in the frame. Up. Final quest trains away in fourth. These Phillies mares are homeward bound. Whole lot of mole with the rail. On the outside is Bell Out and in between horses, Tensaw Candy. They come down to the final furlong and overcharged. And look at her go. Overcharged has the kick and has slipped away from Rumava. Final quest is running on. Overcharged. She is the Cajun Queen. Overcharged for a fourth meet win. She won by a dozen. A dozen length win turf sprinting. Jeff, tell us a little bit about this mayor. I mean, look, on the national stage, she's not that well known. This was Sunday closing day at Fairgrounds when she won. So she didn't even have the Louisiana Derby undercard to kind of get the national attention that she might have had she run 24 hours sooner. Uh, she's got a phenomenal record. She's won uh, 12 races from 15 starts <laughs> and one second. And it's not like, I mean, yeah, most of her wins were against Louisiana bred. She just completely outclasses uh, her state bred uh, foes. But she did place in a graded stakes in New York as a young mm -hmm. two-year-old, or three-year-old, I think. It was, maybe it was a two-year-old. Anyway, back a ways. Uh, so it's yeah. not like she hasn't ventured out of uh, her comfort zone to show that she can run with good fillies anywhere. And she's probably faster and better now than she was when she, when she tried that early in her sure. career. I mean, she won this race by... 12 and a half lengths. Um, when was the last time you saw a five and a half furlong <laughs> sprint? Oh, the winner went by 12 and a half. Now, sometimes I, you might touch a track in the mud or something. They run off yeah. on firm ground. I mean, it just isn't done. The 113 buyer number that she was assigned to not only, I think, is fairly accurate, <laughs> but it makes her up faster than just about any turf sprinter we've seen it like ever you know <laughs> so i don't know i mean it, it's a, maybe it was just one of her days where she got loose on the lead but you get loose on the lead you're going 21 and 2 44 1 55 and 3 you're not getting loose on the lead you're yeah. you're just leaving your foes in the in your dust and i just wonder now uh, as a louisiana bred daughter of star guitar um uh trainer um shane wilson i mean do you get ambitious now you send her to churchill and or somewhere where you can run against open I would. I mean, who's faster yeah. than the pure numbers, you know? 
I would love to see her on the Preakness undercard, and they've got the very one stakes for just fillies and mares, turf sprinters. I think it would be a great fit for national television on the undercard. Uh, I think it would be a great spot. Maybe we can see her Preakness weekend uh, in the very one stakes. I think that would be a good option for most of the races you're going to find in New York or in Kentucky for the, the distaff sprinters on the tar for the turf sprinters are probably going to have to be open company. Keeneland does have one, uh, and, and maybe going to Keeneland and trying the turf sprint company and there the uh giants causeway i believe is the fall meet uh turf sprint for uh just the distaffers but uh she's good man and uh we'd love to see her in open company we talk about these good tough old horses like the chosen vron last week we saluted him and talked about him on this program i love to see these regional superstars these uh uh, dominant performers that are around for a long time. She's six now. And like you said, uh, that record's incredible, you know, with the 12 wins uh, from 15 starts. Her name is Overcharged, and uh, we'd love to see her in one of the big races coming up soon. Hopefully you're introduced to her now on the program. Our topics uh, this week are now official. Jeff Siegel and I say so, and that's how we play the game. So from last to first in the Louisiana Derby, it was catching freedom, winning that one, and heading to Louisville for trainer Brad Cox. No dirt, no guts, no glory. Will they take the chance with Endlessly? The winner of the Jeff Ruby Stakes, trainer Michael McCarthy and company, say not so fast right now to the Kentucky Derby, but we're hoping that the door stays open and they try to go that route. Our Triple Crown tracker took us all over the nation and around the world from Arkansas to Gulfstream to the UAE and some workouts in the morning in between. Looking forward to a huge weekend of racing coming up this week. The Oaks division took shape and her name is Tarifa, our pretty woman, the runner up in the Fairgrounds Oaks. Also expected to join her in Louisville on the first Friday in May. But those look like the dominant horses right now coming out of the Midwest uh, from the fairgrounds Oaks. We'll see what they've got to fire this weekend uh, in the fantasy stakes at Oak Lawn park and our star of the future and present day. We're hoping to see her on the national stage. She's certainly well-known in the region, the Louisiana bred overcharged a top turf sprinter in that part of the country. Again, those five topics official because Jeff Siegel and I, say they are that's how we play it's official each and every week and we'll be back in seven days time to review a huge weekend florida derby arkansas derby dubai world cup uae derby so much going on this weekend and then that all just pivots jeff right into santa anita derby week so this is really good stuff opening week at keeneland just about what 10 days away from now as we record our podcast. So we'll have all the great Keeneland action, bluegrass coming up in a week's time as well. It's going to be a lot of fun over the next several weeks. Certainly will uh, be that. Uh, we will look forward to the Santa Anita Derby here a couple of weeks. Uh, and I do think that um, we're going to learn a lot in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, it's This is by no means definitive, this, this derby crop right now. There are a lot of Colts out there that have a chance to uh, step forward big time. And uh, I don't, I mean, Sierra Leone is the logical top pick, but he's not so dominant that he can't be replaced. You know what I'm right. saying? So sure. uh, it, it's fun. It, it really is. And uh, I just hope everybody uh, who's supposed to make it stays mm -hmm. healthy and, uh, and, and makes it to, to Churchill Downs in one piece. Certainly, we want to pass along our condolences to the connections of the horses from Eddie Keneally's barn that uh, passed tragically in that accident in Lexington on the overpass. Uh, a horrible situation there. Certainly, our hearts and our prayers go to Eddie Keneally and his staff and barn and to the horses that are right now uh, fighting for their lives right now in the equine hospital. So uh, that's a somber note to finish the show on, but we want to look forward to uh, uh, great racing, safe trips to all, and certainly uh, pass along our thoughts there to the Keneally Barn and all involved. Jeff and I will be back on Friday in our Handicapping Podcast first call. But until now and then, have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you on Friday.